overcoming the devil. Today is the first Sunday in the season of Lent, a period of the Christian year designed to help us prepare for the celebration of the mystery of our Lord's victory over all our spiritual enemies, the flesh, the world, and the devil, sin, and death. This trilogy of evil about which we spoke when considering the parable of the sower works together to hinder us from believing and remaining faithful to the Lord. So in order to triumph over sin and death, we must overcome these spiritual enemies. And as we said in our discussion of the parable of the sower, the first case there portrayed in that parable represents those people who hear the word of God, but it says the devil comes, in this case it's represented by birds, and takes the seed of the word of God from their hearts, preventing them from repenting, believing, and bearing fruit in response to the seed of the word of God. Since this is the first and foremost enemy of our spiritual lives, and since the devil's also making a comeback in our popular culture, being portrayed often as a benefactor of humanity, I would like to bring attention to the way scripture reveals who the devil really is and how and why he seeks to hinder the growth of the Word of God in our lives and more importantly, how to overcome him. Our Gospel lesson for today tells us of the temptation of Christ in the desert at the beginning of his ministry, right after his baptism, where you would remember when God opened heavens and publicly declared, this is my beloved son. So here we find that he's moved by the spirit to the desert and then after 40 days of fasting, when he was hungry, the tempter comes to him. And he said, if thou be the Son of God, that is questioning what God had already announced. And he says, if you're the Son of God, command that the stones be made bread. And we, and we know Jesus answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And we will see that this is the pattern that repeats three times, where every time that the devil attempts to make the Lord fa fail, the Lord answers by quoting and upholding the correct teaching of Scripture. But I want to call your attention to the way in which the devil is described first. He's called in this verse the tempter. The Greek word translated tempter is peirason, which is derived from the root word peirazzo, which means to tempt or to put to the test. This etymology suggests the idea of putting someone to the test or trial to see their response, often to cause them to stumble or fall into sin. The word temptation therefore has two mutually exclusive applications. On the one hand, it has a positive application. Like when gold is tested by the heat of fire so that the result is refined gold and its authenticity becomes undeniable and manifest to all. And so Peter, in his first epistle, tells us, you who are kept by the power of God through faith 
unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a reason, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, verizon, trials, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of, than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found into praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Thus, the fire of tribulation, persecution, and adversity may serve to strengthen our faith and draw us nearer to God, indicating how trials, though not pleasant, may yield positive fruits in our lives. On the other hand, the negative side, temptation carries a very bad connotation. When it is intended, as the devil intends, of leading people away from God through various clever schemes, including lies, seduction, and invitations to partake in open rebellion against God. The devil may also use the fire of tribulation and adversity. But the key is that his purpose is to drive people away from God. And in that sense, that's something that God never does. God never pushes people away from him by any means. That's the work of the tempter. So in this negative sense, the devil is the tempter par excellence. Throughout the Bible, this term is used to describe Satan, the adversary, who tempts individuals to stray from God's will and commandments, as he did to the first couple in the Garden of Eden. Yet, the Bible makes it clear that the devil can only work within the constraints that God imposes upon him to act. The devil is not a free agent. He cannot do as he pleases. He's constrained by God's redemptive power and providential care. Indeed, the devil is neither all-knowing nor all-powerful. Although he's always trying to make us believe that he's more powerful than he really is. That is, he's just as powerful as God, but in truth, the reality is very different, as we will see. A clear example of this is seen in the book of Job, which begins with a glimpse behind the scenes where the roots of Job's temptations are set. Job, Job chapter 1 begins with a description of a scene at the heavenly court where Satan is allowed to come and put Job to the test. Satan's allegation before the throne of God that Job's righteousness would vanish as soon as the blessing of God was removed from protecting him from evil. Essentially, Satan insinuated that Job's righteousness was merely a facade, motivated solely by self-interest, by the benefits he received from God. In other words, Job was not really righteous, but was acting out of convenience, since his fear of God had been so amply rewarded in riches and prosperity. But, said the devil, take away from him all that blessing and you will see how quickly he turns against you and curses you. And God permitted the devil to go ahead and test Job. The Lord said unto Satan, verse 12 of chapter 1 of Job, Behold, all that he has is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thy hand. 
So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord and caused calamity to fall upon Job. Here we find a very important principle that we should never forget. All evil is always under the providential control of God. And this is hard for us to come to grips with, but it's true. The devil cannot act to do anything unless God allows him to do it. The purpose of God doing that are mysterious to us. But God does, as we see clearly in this passage. And we will do well to ponder the purpose of God allowing this temptation to go forth. But the key to always remember, even though we do not know God's purposes, is that no temptation of the devil has ever taken God by surprise. The only one surprise by the effectiveness of some of his schemes is the devil himself. In other words, the devil never knows what will be the result of these testings. He did not know how Job would respond to being deprived from God's protecting blessing. The devil truly thinks to have believed that Job will actually curse God. So he got active and did the worst he could within the constraints laid down by God. Satan orchestrated a series of calamities that fell all suddenly upon Job, one upon the other. So in one day, he lost everything. The devil destroyed in one day all his possessions, including oxen, sheep, camels, and servants. They were, they were attacked by enemies, destroyed with fire from heaven, and the news of each calamity came one after the other, and the last news of the day was that his ten children had perished when the house of the elder brother in which they were feasting was brought down by a strong wind, and they all died. Only one messenger survived each of these calamities to be able to bring the news to Job. And how did Job respond to this first wave of temptations? It says in verse 20, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job responded with penitence and worship. And here we find another important principle that we are often ignored. Penitence is an essential part of our worship. Because we are sinners and we cannot approach a holy God in only any other way than recognizing our wickedness. And that's why in the confession of sin, we are honoring the truth of God. So this combination of penitence and worship is the right response to the trial of losing everything. And it's, notice that it's the opposite of what the devil intended. The devil wanted him to curse God. But instead, Job worshiped God with a penitent heart saying, I came into this world having nothing, 
And so I will leave this world. God gave. God took away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, says the scripture, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. In other words, God did not sin against God. He did not curse God. He did not accuse God of wrongdoing or acting foolishly. Why? Because the devil was wrong. Contrary to the devil's expectation, the truth is that Job, Job loved God for himself and not for the benefits that he derived from God. Job was humble. He was conscious of his unworthiness. And Job also knew and trusted the goodness of God in itself not as a function of the benefits he received from God. And that this was made evident when God removed the blessing and God and Job responded in praise. So when the devil engineered his ruin, Job continued to trust and honor God as he had always done. The plan of the devil did not work. Because he wrongly assumed that Job was acting like the devil himself. Only motivated by self-seeking, self-aggrandizing. Which is the net result of the seed of pride. Which is what motivates the devil and us to fall into his temptations. Pride is at the heart of all rebellion. Because pride leads the creature to the throne, the creator and place itself on the throne that only belongs to God. The devil is full of pride, and he judges accordingly. For him, humility, being subject to God, above all, makes absolutely no sense. And therefore, he was taken by surprise by Job's response. And then he tried again. Satan figured that his first wave had not hit the mark because it had not touched the physical well-being of Job himself. So this time he asked permission to afflict Job with a terrible sickness, pain in the body. Satan answered, and this is chapter 2, verse 4, the Lord and said, skin for skin, yeah, all that a man has will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh and he will curse you to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. In other words, you can afflict him but not kill him. So God allowed Satan to afflict Job with painful boils. It says from head to toe, his whole body was covered with painful boils. It says, so when Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot onto his crown, and he took him a potter's shirt and scraped himself with all, and he sat down among ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain your integrity? Curse God and die. But Job said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. The devil again lost his second round. But this time he got an ally, an unsuspected ally. He got the wife to strike the hardest blow at the lowest point. 
Notice that the wife of Job spoke the very purpose of the devil's temptation to lead Job to curse God and embrace death, which is equivalent to a life without God. That's what death is. But again, Job would not do it. He recognized the voice of his wife mouthing the speech of another. His wife was not talking according to wisdom, was, but was giving foolish advice. Anyone that advises you against God is a fool. Know that something similar happened in the life of Jesus. After the devil was not able to entice Jesus to sin against God in this first temptation, he used a more subtle approach and placed the foolish advice in the mouth of Peter after the great confession. It says in Matthew 16, chapter 21, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. And then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Remember, a moment before, Peter had been exalted as being the first to confess the rock of Christianity, which is that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. But as soon as Jesus began to announce his suffering and death, Peter began to scold Jesus, expressing strong disapproval and reprimanding him. But Jesus recognized the voice speaking behind Peter's good intentions of protecting Jesus from temporal harm. It was Satan. And Peter had allowed himself to become the mouthpiece for the devil. So, it says, Jesus turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. For thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Your eyes are set not on heavenly things, but on earthly things. And here we have the principle that will guide us to overcome every temptation of the devil. Whatever voice you hear, coming from anywhere, whatever word of advice or rebuke you face, it may be reduced to this simple test. It either affirms or opposes the will of God as revealed in Scripture. If it affirms the will of God, it's from God. If it drives you away from God, it's from the devil. Whenever the will of the creature opposes the will of the Father, you have an instance of the work of Satan. Regardless of how well it may be disguised or how well intentioned the mouthpiece may be, in such a case, the voice is the voice of Satan and it must be put to silence as Jesus did. Therefore, do not pay attention to any word, any thought, any spirit, any teaching that drives you away from trusting God in all and every circumstance. Trust God above all things, uphold His will always, and deny yourself, and you will be able to overcome the devil in his temptations 
as we see in the good example of Job and our Lord prevailing over all the schemes of our adversary. In our next sermon, God willing, we will continue to explore the teaching of Christ concerning of our adversary as it is revealed in these temptations and how to defeat him. And now, may your obedience be manifest before all men and may you be wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet surely. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord, who for I sake these fast forty days and forty nights, give us grace to use such abstinence that our flesh, being subdued to the Spirit, we may ever obey thy godly motions in righteousness and true holiness to thine honor and glory, who liveth and reigneth with the Father and the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. Amen.